Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to start off today in South America again because I kind of feel in terms of um, you know global ag production, this is an area right now that's undergoing quite a bit of stress. The story remains the same. The flow the uh, coming across the Amazon, the flow from the southwestern monsoon is just extremely weak. We've seen the models just trend drier and then stay drier for the next about 10 days and possibly well beyond that as well. We're also going to see temperatures getting into this section of Brazil that are going to be well into the 90s and low 100s in Fahrenheit, some locations topping 40 degrees uh, C. So this is the story that we're going to be watching. The same thing has been going on down here in southern Brazil that's been happening in southern Brazil for about 60 days now, and that has been just repeated rounds of very, very heavy rainfall. And we continue to see the models predicting you know, anomalies over four inches uh, in total down in this area. Meanwhile, we watch the models continue to toy with parts of um, Argentina, reflecting better rains at times and then kind of pulling back away from it. And as you can see now, we, we see a little bit less here. Uh, so later on today, middle of the day, uh, I'm going to be on uh, a webinar with Angie Setzer. I Her uh, Twitter handle is Goddess of Grain. I think you can go sign up for it there. Just find her on Twitter and you'll find the registration. And we're going to spend most of our time in that webinar just talking about what controls the Brazilian monsoon and what affects her yields. So we'll dig into that later today. So I'm going to leave you right here with, with this particular story in Brazil. From there, I want to take you to the um, North Pacific, and we watched a pretty sizable system over the last 48 hours roll into parts of Alaska. So you can just barely see southern Alaska in this scene, but look at this. That's a deep low, and it dumped a lot of snow. I have some problems with this pattern and the way it's evolved based upon what we originally thought it was going to do, and it's really kind of manifesting itself in these 10-day uh, forecast maps here. So as you take a look, notice in the west, we've seen a little bit of a drier trend, uh, especially especially for parts of California, as these next lows are not expected to kind of just bombard the west coast with strong westerly flow. The piece that's been consistent has been the wetter conditions across the cotton belts and the drier conditions forecast for the Midwest. We watched a continual drying trend in the models, which was a bit disappointing. We talked about it yesterday uh, in this area. We have to just watch all of it as it plays out here because we're still talking about the same things. Look at our latest 40 centimeter or 16 inch soil moisture values. And there's a large section here of the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Missouri Basin, and several other major rivers that get into the Mississippi that are low. And even though we are seeing this area hopefully get a little bit of recovery in its soil moisture, the deficits to the south of this are, are still quite substantial. Now that's not to ignore other parts around the country, but it's just one of the stories we've been following here with respect to the Mississippi River, which was recovering. You can kind of see it came out of the basement about 12 feet below low stage and popped up here to where it was almost at four feet below low stage. But as of early this morning here on November the 10th, we're at about five and a third feet below low stage. And so is this recovery gonna continue kind of like what it did a year ago, um, or are we gonna be watching an ongoing problem in Mississippi? If you let the models give you the answer, they, they recover. I mean, they really recover in a big way, and I'll, I'll finish with that uh, in this video. So here's the issue at hand. We've been talking about the fact that the jet, which was extended and then shifted a bit south, has now turned itself back over to the western side of the Pacific, and it is retracted. And the most significant part of that is that instead of just barreling across the country like it has been doing, we're now going to get a little bit more meridional flow. We're going to watch for some splitting action in the um, in the Pacific. And normally when I see that happening, it's kind of a, it's a setup, man. It kind of tends to get things to where they become a bit more amplified across the country. The problem is, is that uh, it's kind of like the setup man's late and uh, the timing of it isn't, I think, what, what a lot of us, my, myself included, originally thought. So here's what we're really thinking about. You know, if you go back over the last, you know, few weeks here from like the end of October through the first week of, 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 of November, excuse me, there was our southward extended jet right there. And that was the one that was really initiating better flow across the country. These are the late October, uh, early November systems. Uh, and then we were helping this by just keeping the flow going, screaming across the Atlantic and really hammering across Europe. Well, that whole setup is now different and gone. It looks something like this. And as you look at this animation, the, the, the mid-level flow in the atmosphere is pretty weak. And we just don't have any major push behind this right now to force big systems to just dive into the United States. That's, that's part of the diagnosis of this overall pattern. But I want you to see the combination of short waves here. There's one uh, on the back side, there's a second one right out here, and we've, we've even got this piece that's a bit farther down to the south. And the best way to look at this is to go to the vorticity maps. 
So that's why we watch for short waves. It's really about the movement of cyclonic flow in the atmosphere. So as we play through the day today, there's our broader short wave. Or I guess we should call this maybe a part of a, a long wave with the short waves embedded. Now, here's the thing. If you're kind of going to get to the point, Snodgrass, I get it. What I watched in the forecast model trends this week is that by Saturday into Sunday and Monday, this deepens into a pretty large low that is sitting off the Pacific Northwest coast. But there's nothing behind it to force it to go onshore. So what it ended up doing is for next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, let's get out through there. There's Wednesday and Thursday. Look at that. The low stayed way out to open ocean. Earlier model runs had this just sliding right into California. Remember we talked about it all, all week. It was the moisture coming into California, what it was going to do. Now we still have the southern branch of this initiating lows that are going to go across the south. So the south stays wet. But this was the, uh, an important trend in the latest European model runs that suggest that now the west coast doesn't stand the same kind of chance through the uh, next five days at really delivering that heavy, heavy precip into California. It's still coming, but it's, it, it just is underperforming initial thoughts. We then get out there to the middle of next week and then next Thursday, Friday, and beyond, and things start to really begin to sh maybe advertise better flow troughs coming in and if these get over the mountains remember that's been my story if we can get one of these over the mountains then we light up the mid part of the country again but right now as it stands this whole pattern has just lost some of its kick it's lost its momentum so we just stitched together your next seven days from the wpc and look at all the white that's in this image these are all areas that are going to be relatively dry for the next seven days and even though the wpc still goes after decent moisture for california coastal oregon and washington and even parts of the southwest this isn't anything compared to what it had earlier in the week the more robust signal is this we're going to watch the end of that subtropical jet piece come through here and all along the gulf coast we have the threat for some very very heavy rainfall now, some of this is going to be really welcomed in parts of Louisiana and Mississippi. Remember, these are two states that are still in exceptional drought. You can go check out the latest drought monitor. Just Google drought monitor and you'll be able to see it. And that's going to be an area that desperately needs this rainfall coming forward here. So let's take a look at where things are right now. The last 10 hours or so of uh, radar is shown right here. And again, we watched the cold front undercut, but then the subtropical pulse of moisture just roll over the top of that. And it just continues to extend and open. Now the northern edge of this has had a little bit too much dry air at the surface for a lot of this to hit the ground. And that's why when we look at the last you know, 72 hours of total accumulated precip, you may see radar echo over this area, but we're getting virga out of it. In other words, it's evaporating before it hits the ground. Well, remember, this is just the first round of multiple shots at some wetter weather that are going to be coming through. So let's pick this up at around 7 or 8 o'clock this morning and watch that shield of precipitation kind of move its way to the east. Again, we do see the chance in the Appalachian Mountains here of maybe picking up some snow. So keep an eye out if you're at these higher elevations right into this area. And there is some cold enough air here that uh, we're going to get some snow in parts of um, uh, New Mexico as well. Now remember, undercutting all of this is some pretty chilly air right now. It's temporarily going to live in this area, but the flow is going over the top of it. And that's what's driving all this precipitation through the middle of the day today. Getting into tonight and then into early tomorrow morning, the heaviest rains are going to stretch right along the Gulf Coast. We do see another front coming in parts of the Pacific Northwest as well. Going into Saturday midday, Saturday afternoon and evening, and then playing out here into early Sunday morning, you can see our next kind of round of moisture trying to work its way through there. But this story is still being told kind of from this northern hemisphere view of the jet stream pattern. I just want to go back to that so you can kind of see the whole thing stitched together. So going through the weekend, look at how the pattern is breaking up here across so much of the Pacific Ocean. It's splitting here in parts of the United States. We still don't see any of the huge ridging events that sometimes anchor themselves up against, you know, the west coast here of North America or the east coast. But uh, so you can't call this a blocked pattern, but I'll tell you something. It's really a different look from what we've had for the last 10 to 15 days. You then get out there past mid-month and the jet is now fully retracted, but we're still getting pieces of it to come across. And like the PNA is not skyrocketing positive during this time period, which means no big ridges on the West Coast. This is what's going to keep the cotton belt alive with some heavier rain as we work our way toward the middle of the month. So this is next week and next weekend. And as we just play this out, I'm just wondering if the pattern is loading itself up for finally doing what I've been calling for, which is to have at least two big lows to finish the month, get over the Rocky Mountains and roll across the country. You see, sometimes when you get the jet stream to kind of bust apart way out here south of the Aleutian Islands, 
it tends to give enough amplitude in the flow to start getting systems to roll through here. So there's still some you know, hope for the pattern I called for over the last few weeks at showing up at the end of this month. But I, I need to see more out of this to really kind of give you a solid forecast as the timing of those things. But I do want to kind of clue us back into our two models, the GFS on the left, European on the right. We've already watched through Saturday. Here it is. Let's get into Sunday. So there's our next weaker coastal low coming in here. We see the next push of rain coming through Texas. We're going to watch that spread almost in the same spot. Look at this as the system is doing right now. It goes across parts of the south. And then the European model, you know, probably most aggressive on bringing it farther into the southeast compared to the GFS, which all week long trended with higher pressure over the mid-Atlantic. Now, the same time period, this, this, we're watching the west coast, right? So just look, there's that low on Tuesday, getting into Wednesday, staying well offshore in the European, but coming closer in the GFS. And as it does so, the GFS is by far going to be the wetter model in this particular scenario because of the proximity of that low to the west coast of California. Man, the European just really trended much, much farther uh, to, to the west. Now, at the end of the run, we start to see, you know, kind of the same thing the models keep doing. Like, oh, no, just yank this out into the mid part of the country, kick off a big system. Um, but I, I'm just sitting here going, prove it, man. Prove that this is really going to happen. We're going to finally get a system like this to actually come through. Now, one other thing to point out here is that the GFS is still trying to kick off like a big hurricane over Cuba. And I want to let you know that it's not fully there in the ensemble support, but we do need to watch the Caribbean for maybe some tropical development. So if we just walk through a few areas here, how about we just do a national view on total precipitation from the European model through the next uh, seven days. And I think you're going to see that the biggest difference in the models. In fact, let's just go look at it. Okay, there's your seven day. Let's do this. Let's do uh, ECMWF uh, versus the GFS. Yeah, look at that. ECMWF way wetter, cotton belt, GFS way wetter into California. And so that's, that's what you just saw in that animation. So this is it. That's your seven day outlook. Now, speaking of this area down south, look at how much water the European is trying to put into that region. We've got widespread one to three to four inches and heavier amounts as you get along the Gulf Coast. And then if you go over into the southeast, this is where, again, the European model is the wetter of the two models, but it's trying to hit an area that we've been talking about all week that's been in some form of drought. The west coast, remember, the Europeans stealing that moisture from California. So if you're curious what the GFS looks like, just take all of this, which is way up here in the two-inch range, and just shove it into the Sierra Nevada mountains. So that will be one of the more important trends we'll watch in the model runs this weekend. If we then just take a look at snow, well, this map won't verify if that low gets closer. We'll put a whole lot more snow to the Sierra Nevada than currently forecast. But some of the models were much more aggressive here in the northern Cascades at dumping a lot of snow, which is an area that just needs to start building it up early this season. Okay, how about some probability maps? Chance at getting less than a half inch is shown here. Widespread throughout the Canadian Prairie, Northern Plains, least side of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, your wettest spots are down here and right here along the Pacific Northwest Coast. So if we flip over to the chances of getting two inches, look at that. Very heavy rainfall down here and along parts of coastal, um, you know, California, Oregon, and, and Washington. So that just kind of reiterates some of the same things we were just talking about. Now, I'm going to be honest, you know that I've been calling for these two, at least two big systems in the second half of the month. And the models just are like, oh, you want that, Eric? Let's, let's see what we can do. Next Saturday, look at this. That's the low that's sitting off the West Coast the end of next week. That's the one that never kind of gets there. The models are trying to take it, toss it right in the Southern Plains. And if that happens, yeah, this is a system next weekend to be talking about. And then it does it again. It just tosses another low out here by the 21st of November into the West Coast and tries to rake that one across the country. And again, that would be it. If those two things verified, my two systems by the end of the month in the midsection of the country would, would verify. And these, again, would go up the East Coast as well. But as it stands, we're going to wait and see. I'm not going to hold my breath on this, given how drier the week two forecasts have been compared to uh, excuse me, how much drier the week two verification has been against the week two forecast. But I will show you a week two forecast regardless. And uh, our government, the CPC, is wet. The European model is wet. And even the GFS trended wet. So I, okay, I got to get a wave over the mountain first. 
Uh, so let's see how that all plays out as we look at these longer range model runs. From there, let's talk about temperatures. Again, I told you that cold air undercutting all of that moisture flowing into the south and southeast. Yeah, temperatures again today, 10 to 15 to 20 degrees cooler than they were yesterday. But the cold air is relatively short lived. So here it is on Friday, going into Saturday, it's still chilly down here. We then go into Sunday. Now, a lot of this is just cloud cover and, and rain cooled air. But look at the heat coming back into the midsection of the country and in the west by Monday and Tuesday. I mean, we've got temperatures that are now back up here 20 to 25 degrees above average. That's what happens when the jet stream splits over this area this time of year. So how long does that warmer air last? Well, there's something I'm really trying to clue in on here. So we go back to the um, uh, to our one of our my favorite sets of maps. This is the five day sliding window of average temperature anomalies. This is the heat coming in. OK, this is now getting into the week of Thanksgiving. And then one of the things that has been shifting in the pattern, I think the GFS is maybe one of the first models to pick up on it, is that you see some of the models out there in day 10 to 15 are trying to build up a bit of a storehouse of colder air. And if something in the jet comes along to dislodge this, that'll come slamming across the country. But that's a big if. We got to get the jet stream to dislodge it and send that weather across the rest of the country. Okay, so bigger picture things just to think about this weekend as we work on a new long range outlook for next week. This is the most El Nino look I have seen from the atmosphere since this El Nino began, which you could make an argument started maybe back in uh, February. And it's the westerly wind bursts that are coming out here. We talked about it all week. I still tell you the IOD is in control, the Indian Ocean Dipole, but with this westerly wind burst, we're going to see the MJO come right back over to where it's lived for a while, which is here. And this is some of the indications I have for saying that the second half of this month could do what I've hoped it's going to do, which is to deliver those two big systems to the central U.S. And if you say, well, if the MJO goes to phase eight or phase one, what does it mean? It means this. It just means you get those western U.S. troughs that kick across the country. So I just see some support in this that I want to make sure that you understand I'm not overly confident, but there are some indicators going forward. But we're really getting more of an El Nino flavor going forward in this pattern. And I just wonder if that's really going to be the stronger influence on this. So this is be where I finish up today, just showing you that the outlook from the end of November through the 21st of December, boy, the models just continue to advertise flow. They just continue to put the flow together. And what's to be honest with you, if we get half of this, it's a decent start to winter in terms of reducing drought area across the country. One of the things we'll be talking about next week is uh, the kind of bigger picture global pattern here for this winter with respect to um, uh, you know El Nino and its influence because the models have bit into it. And I just want to remind you again, uh, middle of the day today, we're going to do a, a webinar with Angie Setzer, Goddess of Grain. If you go look her up on Twitter and you can get registered for that webinar, we'll talk a bit about South America and try to understand what's to be expected here. So I'm going to stop there until I'll have a good rest of your day and we'll talk again next week. Thanks.